And today we're having a startup cafe discussion. Thank you to our entrepreneurial community for joining us today to hear a story from Robin Berthier about his experience building network perception. It's just one of the companies that have incubated um, in the walls. They were just down the hallway, if you look virtually behind me, where they were growing a company that emerged out of research at the University of Illinois from one of our most preeminent centers, the Information Trust Institute. It was there that they realized that they had software that industry needed, in particular the utility industry. And Robin, as a researcher, research scientist working there, was the individual that could help advance that beyond it being just in a research context, but to move to the marketplace. He became the founder and CEO of the company Network Perception and has continued to build it from there. They have customers across the globe and he'll talk to, to you about his experience today. I think everyone is very curious in our community always about that transition of going from a research environment to then a startup company of the journey of being a startup company and how you uh, make the transition from an academic mindset to a commercial mindset. So let's uh, please give a warm welcome to Robin and thank you for coming back to Enterprise Works virtually today to share your startup cafe story. Welcome Robin. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the introduction and thank you for inviting me. It's always a, a pleasure to uh, to reconnect with the Enterprise Works uh, community and the research park at large. So always a, always a pleasure to uh, uh, to present our experience. Um, my goal today is, is, as Laura said, to really um, share uh, this journey we went through from the initial uh, research to uh, to now uh, a company with uh, 15 employees um, and uh, what were the different stages uh, we uh, went through and what I think were the key ingredients uh, that uh, helped us to advance and move forward through that uh, journey. Uh, before I dive in, I uh, just wanted to give a bit of background on myself. I've done my uh, grad school at the University of Maryland in College Park in cybersecurity. Um, over there, I worked on two, uh, two technological projects that became uh, open source software, uh, both in the area of uh, network visualization and, and cybersecurity. And it was interesting to uh, understand how the transition from uh, a lab project to an open source that other users in industry could use um, already kind of perked my interest into that, uh, that technology transfer area that was useful later in my career. Uh, then I hired at the University of Illinois, first as a postdoc and then research scientist, worked on uh, intrusion detection systems for smart meters. So that allowed me to discover the world of uh, the electric industry and critical infrastructures. And then started to work on their firewall analysis tool. So join a research project there uh, with uh, a technology that then became network perception in, in 2014. So if I look back at the, at the different stages we went through, uh, from the initial uh, research project uh, almost eight years ago to then the decision to branch out of the lab, launch the company, and then uh, the first few years of, of uh, refactoring our research code into a commercial product, and now like building the business uh, side of the company and, and growing, uh, keeping that mission to really support the needs of uh, critical infrastructure and making sure they can implement their cybersecurity and compliance-based practices. So I've divided that journey into five stages and I want to, uh, to go through each of them with you uh, and uh, share what I think are the, the important uh, ingredients for, uh, for de-risking and uh, building a healthy, healthy business. It's, it's a journey about removing uh, challenges and making sure we have uh, solid uh, foundation to uh, to continue uh, continue evolving. Uh, before I go through those stages, just wanted to um, give you a bit of uh, more background on on the company itself, the product we have. So we are in the area of uh, networks becoming more and more complex. Uh, everything, an IP address getting connected. Uh, it's estimated that today we have more than twenty billion. Uh, computers, uh, Internet of Things that are connected through different networks and that continues to grow. 
And that's put a very uh, heavy challenge for organizations to protect themselves because networks are their first line of defense and they're under constant uh, attack uh, and they need to really put forward a strong uh, cybersecurity plan to, uh, to defend themselves. We looked at the way this uh, network security landscape evolved over the past uh, two decades. So from my uh, early days in the grad school where everything was about uh, protection, we were building fences around our equipment, uh, trying to uh, prevent anyone from coming in, uh, then discovering that wasn't sufficient. So investing in uh, intrusion detection systems uh, that are still very relevant today, but also uh, expensive because you have to detect after the breach occur. And then more recently, uh, governments stepping in and adding a layer of regulation. And we see that trend uh, that will continue over the next five to 10 years, uh, organizations, industries uh, adopting what we call a culture of security, where it's no longer just the IT department uh, securing everything. It's really everyone's role to make sure we follow best practices, make sure we follow uh, the standards. Uh, we have internal controls. We check on each other's uh, uh, best use of our computer resources or networks uh, to prevent uh, breaches and, and data leak. Uh, that's that's evolved quite rapidly over the last five, 10 years. It's still very much a challenge uh, for multiple reasons. First, organizations have to do that 24-7. Uh, there should be no gap in the way they execute. Attacks can go extremely fast. They need to adapt to uh, changes in terms of their, their technology. They adopt uh, cloud-based solutions, for example, uh, new ways to uh, use automation, uh, also changes in their workforce, uh, and, and then changing in their use cases, and then really gaining and maintaining a visibility on their systems, knowing what they have connected, how those are configured, and how can they measure uh, the progress they're making towards this adoption of, of best practices? And to make this picture even more complex, now we have multiple groups who have to work together. So we have the traditional IT and networking departments. We have cybersecurity. We have what we call the GRC groups, so governance, risk, and compliance. And then in some industries, auditors uh, coming on site and checking that everything is uh, following the rules. And really the, the pain point that we uh, identified and for which we built a technology is around helping those different uh, groups uh, to align each other uh, with the same understanding of uh, how things are configured, how things are secured, and, uh, and really uh, uh, protecting the organization at large. So we looked at those four core challenges and we developed a platform uh, that uh, is building a model of uh, the network uh, through a set of benchmarks. And what's unique about the technology that we've built is to be able to help both technical as well as non-technical users. So from the beginning, we emphasize uh, the need to have really strong uh, usability. And uh, this means like very intuitive user interfaces. We wanted to depart from the uh, traditional uh, large IT, uh, IT uh, solutions that can be uh, heavy to deploy, complex to understand. So we wanted to really adopt a model of modern uh, user interfaces and helping our, our, our users to, uh, to get up to speed and, and get results quickly. So we've developed uh, two products. Our initial product, NPView, uh, can ingest data from firewalls, routers, and uh, network switches. Instantly, it will display a topology map of the network, which means you can see uh, how things are connected and what are the exposure of different computers or workstation inside your uh, different network zones and access policy. And then you can do risk assessment and compliance assessment across your organization. So you can really identify what are the potential problems or gaps in terms of your uh, cybersecurity plan and then uh, remediate them. We took that concept and then moved it to a continuous monitoring solution uh, aspect. So that's NP Live. So same features, but NP Live really uh, brings 
24 uh, seven uh, monitoring capabilities. And that's opening up uh, new use cases for us. So from the project-based uh, risk assessment and audit uh, use case to now having uh, change management, uh, the ability to do uh, sandboxing, which means to design a network and make sure it's correctly configured before uh, pushing it to, uh, to the actual devices. Uh, and this expansion allows us to, on the business side, uh, expand our footprint with our customers, which may make uh, having the software being used by other business units and other groups. So uh, give you an example of uh, what our, our users would go through. They would import uh, configuration files of their firewalls and they would see a map like this one. They can then select the target. So in this example, I, I picked a, a target on the right and every node in this map is a computer. And so the software is telling us everything in red has a direct connection with this target, while nodes in orange will be one stepping stone away or like one jump host away. So that's an important information to have because if you know that an orange computer is getting compromised, then through this map, you also understand that the attacker would have to compromise one of the red ones before getting access to the target. So it's a picture that's revealing your defense in depth, like how many layers of access policies you have around your critical assets. And in the context of an electric utility, that's, uh, that's extremely important. Like for example, you can imagine uh, a computer in charge of uh, the settings of a uh, protection relay in a substation where you have uh, power lines being uh, uh, directed by some key uh, IT resources then you want to make sure that this computer has multiple layers of defense around it so that no one on the internet or even uh, from the corporate uh, side of the, of the organization uh, goes in those lateral movement in the network and then reaches that, that critical computer to then change settings on a power line or a power transformer. So the, our users are leveraging this type of, uh, of analysis and visualization to uh, to strengthen their access policies and make sure they don't have any gap in their, in their configurations. So uh, today we have close to hundred customers, uh, mostly in the electric uh, industry. We've uh, also having some traction in other industries such as transportation, oil and gas, uh, financial institutions. Uh, it's been interesting to see how our use cases are, are being uh, driven in those different areas. Uh, what's, uh, what's good for us is that uh, the technology itself applies horizontally, which means that a firewall remains a firewall regardless if it's deployed in an electric utility, in a, in a university, in a, in, a, in a bank. And so the technology that we've developed can really help uh, each, of those, uh, each of those contexts. This was to uh, explain uh, the, the product that we've uh, developed and uh, where we are today. Now I'd like to go back to the initial days of uh, thinking of, of, uh, of incorporating network perception. And I, I divided that journey into five stages. And so the first stage, I'm calling that foundation. And this was the work we were doing at the, the Information Trust Institute at the University of Illinois. And what I've identified as, as really the key ingredients for, for success there were uh, really early having uh, strong relationships with the uh, key stakeholders from both the, the government and industry. So we were working with the Department of Energy and the Department of Homeland Security. And those relationships helped us to uh, really do fundamental research with uh, a strong uh, practical aspect because we were able to get feedback on the technology we were building very early, which means we were not working on a, on a theoretical uh, research and then uh, uh, in a vacuum, we were having direct uh, communication with our potential users and they were telling us what challenges they were facing, what pain point they were facing. And I think that really helped us to remain focused on their needs uh, and, uh, and build a solution that, uh, that they would use long term. So that was this uh, foundational stage uh, to, uh, to help us uh, uh, develop that technology. Then the next, uh, the next evolution was to uh, go from 
thinking, okay, we have an interesting research project. Maybe uh, there is uh, something beyond that uh, project where we could have uh, an organization. And the key question there was, we know we have something that users want, how to best uh, maintain uh, that technology, how to best support it, how to best keep developing it. And for that, you have different routes. You can open source uh, your technology and having a, an open source community to help you uh, develop it. Uh, you can try to uh, sell your technology to an existing organization, or you can create your own, uh, your own uh, uh, in co corporation to, uh, to develop it. So we work closely with the Office of Technology Management. They have a really well-defined process to help you think through those, through those questions. Uh, they give you guidance and uh, really help you with uh, market research uh, and uh, understanding the potential of, of your technology. We also got uh, help from, again, the Department of Homeland Security. They have a grant specifically for tech transfer. So we had a year to uh, go on the road and be able to test our prototype with uh, multiple uh, electric utilities. And underlying, we were also, uh, uh, it was a good time because in the industry, we were more pushed towards this culture of compliance that was being uh, developed and also a push towards uh, technology and automation. So we were really at the right time between uh, the, the product we were, the prototype we are building, and then those those different trends that were uh, pushing in that direction. So from uh, uh, these uh, those elements, we've decided to uh, establish network perception. So we uh, incorporated the company in 2013. It took us about uh, six to nine months to uh, really put together a, a vision plan. Uh, what where what we wanted to be when we grew up, uh, where we wanted the company to go, how we wanted the technology to, uh, to evolve, and then what would be the different uh, milestones we wanted to, uh, to reach. And then that led to uh, uh, really starting to work full time. So at the time I was uh, still a research scientist at the, at the Information Trust Institute. And then I started to divide my time between working at the university in the, in the research lab and then uh, dedicated time for, for the company. And it's really in uh, 2014 that I, I, I switched full time to uh, to the company. Uh, we opened an office in Enterprise Works, and then uh, the goal there was to uh, work on the proof of concept. We had a prototype. How to make sure that this prototype has uh, has really value in the long term and can become a, a product. So thanks to uh, Enterprise Works, we get access to a lot of resources in, uh, in the legal aspect, the accounting. Uh, we also had uh, uh, assistance and, and help with the design. For example, our, our company logo was uh, designed uh, uh, through the internship program at uh, Enterprise Works. Uh, we've done some market research. We had our office over there. Uh, and, then, uh, and then we got access to the entrepreneur in residence. And that's how I met uh, uh, Ted Green, which he, who is our, our CEO now. So those really uh, connections and relationships helped uh, uh, drive the, the business as well. Uh, in the larger research park, we also worked with uh, Illinois Ventures and Sarah Ventures. We are uh, now investing in the, in the company today. But uh, having those connections early in the journey of the company where instrumental uh, for us to uh, you know, get, their, get their advice and, and build the business as well. In addition, we uh, uh, leveraged the assistance from Enterprise Works regarding writing a, an SBIR grant, a small business innovation research grant from the National Science Foundation. So we applied in, uh, in late uh, 2014, uh, received it. And so that helped to fund the business for the first two years, 2014, 15, 16. Uh, we got a, a grant there that, that helped us to translate that proof of concept into, a, into an actual product. The next stage was really once we had um, a really strong technology uh, to work towards product market fit. We already had a product market fit with our early adopters, um, but there was a transition to, uh, to be made to go to the larger uh, community of users in the electric industry. 
And for that, uh, one key uh, ingredient for success was to have a strong relationship with uh, the auditors in the electric industry and in particular with NERC. So NERC stands for uh, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. Uh, they are the ones, they are the, the body uh, defining the standards and also managing the team of auditors who will check on uh, electric utilities to make sure they, they follow the rules. And they also have a mandate from the government to be able to issue penalties in case uh, rules are not followed. Uh, because uh, the US government really push, uh, uh, I mean, sees the electric uh, infrastructure as, as really critical and key for the nation in terms of national security. So NERC can issue fines of up to $1 million per day of, uh, of a violation. To give you an example, there was a large uh, utility in the Southeast uh, last year in 2019 that received a $10 million uh, penalty because they had 127 violations. So that results in utilities really dedicating resources to um, have uh, extremely strong uh, compliance programs and making sure their networks, IT, OT resources are well configured and our product plays a key role there. So in the example I just gave with the $10 million fine, out of those 127 violations, uh, NPVU uh, would have been uh, key to avoid like a third of them. Uh, so that, that uh, utility actually became our, our largest customer because uh, uh, NPU was part of their mitigation plan to, uh, to address their, uh, their limitations in compliance programs. Um, another interesting, uh, activity that we've uh, went through uh, around 2017-2018 was so we we sold licenses of NPU to NERC so NERC has started to adopt uh, the product as part of their processes so they've uh, they've now uh, uh, they're using it nationwide across all the audits um, and really for us what was interesting was to uh, transition from being a, a really technology centric com company to focus on the customer success. And that means like not only building a great product, but how is understanding how a customer is, is using that product, uh, like the complete life cycle around uh, the, the initial interest to then uh, buying a license, uh, deploying the solution, uh, developing processes, training users, uh, and then and then closing the loop in terms of what the technology is finding and how they can improve their compliance posture. And that requires to uh, you know, think really uh, larger than just, than just the technology itself. And uh, that's when uh, my colleague uh, Ted uh, joined us and really uh, uh, helped us with his experience building uh, early stage tech companies to uh, put those those building blocks together around the business infrastructure. Like, what do we need for customer success? What do we need for sales and marketing? Uh, what do we need in terms of of uh, just the financial milestones we need to, to track the metrics? Uh, and and that's what we've we've been really focusing on over the last two years. Um, and then more recently, uh, I mean, we've been self funded from the. The, the early days of network perception up until this year that where we we saw I would say maybe a year ago uh, an acceleration in the in the traction we received from the industry so uh, more demands from our, our customers uh, the types of discussions we had with them were evolving from them just wanting to buy the software for a single product to now wanting us to be in their budget for the following years and, and deploying the technology across all their devices. So we felt that it was time to um, uh, ra uh, raise our, our very first uh, round of uh, funding. We also looked at the potential growth we could have in uh, terms of the addressable market uh, in the electric industry, as well as in other critical infrastructure, such as uh, oil and gas, financial transportation, uh, healthcare, and and uh, put together a plan uh, to raise a, a, a two million dollar Series C. Uh, so we've just closed that a month ago. Uh, so, so Sarah Ventures is uh, one of our lead investors. We also have 
Energy Foundry in Chicago, as well as Okapi Ventures in, in, in Los Angeles. And so with this new team of investors really focusing now on building up on top of the success we have and, and growing the business to, uh, uh, to expand to those other industries. And having investment in key uh, strategic initiatives, uh, both in sales marketing, customer success, and, and the product roadmap. So that's where we are today, uh, really uh, putting together those, those initiatives, defining the roadmap for the next uh, few years. Uh, it's been quite a, a transition. We were uh, eight uh, full-time employees earlier this year. We're now 15 and growing. Uh, so 2020 has been, uh, has been uh, interesting to say the least. And then for me personally, that was also, uh, uh, that was also quite strange going from a very small team where everyone is wearing multiple hats and, and doing things uh, ad hoc whenever we have challenges to solve to now really having a, a much uh, better defined uh, set of processes and infrastructure where we can delegate, where we can uh, solve things as, as teams, but having specific departments and accountability. So my my day-to-day -day, uh, activities have been, uh, have been changing quite a bit uh, over the last few weeks, uh, but really exciting and, uh, and putting together um, what we call the OKRs, objectives and key results to make sure we, we track our progresses, we continue to grow and we have key milestones to, uh, to reach. And with this, um, I'd like to uh, open for, for question. If anyone has any question or things that would like, like me to go back to, I'll be, I'll be glad to do so. Thanks, Robin. I'm gonna help um, with more discussion along some of the topics that you've raised. It was great to hear your journey. Um, we were there in the beginning, but I realize not quite the very earliest when it was emerging out of ITI. I think the story helps to illustrate the, the, the various pivots that occur from a company perspective. And you talked about investment. Early on, there was already traction in the market of the software when it first came out of the university. And I recall that there was kind of a decision making of whether to take outside capital and when. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Now you are raising money and you've had partnerships with Illinois Ventures. And I know Daniel's on the call today from Illinois yep. Ventures and from Sarah Ventures based in Champaign. Can you talk a little bit more about that and I'd invite Daniel to join in this conversation if he has thoughts about the timing and reasons to take venture funding in order to accelerate the growth of the company? Yeah, no, great question. I think it's, it's um, all about uh, timing and level of comfort with uh, risk taking uh, in terms of our team of uh, founders. We are, you know, we felt from the, the beginning that we wanted to uh, grow the business. Uh, uh, I would say in, in the right way. Like we don't want we don't want to you know jump and, and go too fast without validating some key aspect of of uh, of the business, and that's why we. We kind of uh, delayed, uh, you know, not not raising a run of investment in the first years, but uh, really getting to uh, uh, to have solid foundations first before we raise we raise a round. But you know, I think both uh, both strategies could work. Um, it's at the end, it's really where do you want the business to go? What's your level of comfort with the risk you're taking? Um, and, uh, and the timing of the industry uh, in terms of, of this product market fit, whether the pain point you're solving is something that's just this year, something that's, that's long-term. Um, so it, it, it took us a, a few years to, to get to that level of comfort. Daniel's on, and I'm gonna invite him to join in this portion of the discussion. Daniel, what interests you about network perception from Illinois Ventures is the opportunity to go beyond utilities, uh, growth area, or other um, opportunities you see as an investor? Right. There, there are a lot of things we really liked about um, investing in network perception. Um, I think first and foremost was um, the team and, and what they've done the past few years. They really were very capital efficient. They really honed in on their product market fit. Um, I think we, I joined Illinois Ventures in 2018 and, and um, Tom had been talking to Robin and the team even before then. Um, so we were familiar with the company. So it was great to already know them um, and see the company develop. Um, but the one of the other things we really liked was the traction is they had 
carved out what at first was a niche, but is what is now becoming an industry standard. Um, and it's exciting to see um, it does open up the opportunity to go into other critical infrastructure um, industries. Um, but what they were able to do in the energy industry was pretty unique, I think, um, in, in the market they were able to carve out, especially now. It just meets the intersection of cybersecurity and public policy in a unique way that a lot of companies don't. A lot of companies only focus on the cybersecurity aspect, um, whereas network perception falls in a bit of a different area that not many, not many players were addressing. Thanks, Daniel. Another aspect that was touched on, and feel free to put questions in the chat that you have for Robin, or if you want to come back to Daniel, I'm sure he could, could continue. Um, Robin also talked about the role of the Office of Technology Management, which is our tech transfer office at the University of Illinois. This was technology that licensed out of the university. And Svetlana is joining us from OTM to talk a little bit more about that relationship with Robin. And I'd be curious if you have questions you want to ask him as well, but love for your perspective, Svetlana. Thanks, Laura. Um, glad to be joining your Startup Cafe. Um, well, I would like to, I always like to hear um, from our licensee to hear from Robin um, how he saw the engagement with um, OTM. Um, we always look for ways to improve on and you know, sort of, I don't know, speed up or just in general improve our um, negotiations and licensing process with our startup companies. Um, and uh, I know I worked, uh, I think I worked mostly with the uh, uh, David Nickel and uh, Bill Sanders at the time um, in negotiation with in negotiating the license. Um, but if Robin has any perspective, I would love to hear that. And Robin, I'm going to add to that. Um, since you did license out of the university, I'm guessing there was a patent involved. And there's also questions often about software and the role of patents and its value to have a university right. license or a patent on software. If you could address either of those areas, that'd be great too. Sure. That's right. Sure. So they licensed the patent and the software. So it was a patent and software license. Yeah, the, the negotiation itself with OTM. I mean, first, I'd like to repeat what I said earlier, like the I was impressed with uh, the process that OTM put together because they really have, you know, defined the, the key questions uh, that you need to ask yourself when, um, whenever you have an interest in, in, uh, in tech transfer. And uh, that process was, at least to me, really helpful to understand uh, the different directions we could take, uh, what were the pros and cons of each. And um, it felt better to have, you know, OTM being being there with their experience doing transfer over many years. Uh, for me, it was kind of the, the, the first time I was going through that. So it, it felt good to, uh, to be well surrounded there. Um, then the negotiation itself, yes, yeah, as you said, Vedlana, uh, Bill and David were uh, leading that, uh, those negotiations. Uh, I think we, uh, uh, it went pretty well. Uh, it, it took uh, some time, of course, but uh, we were able to find a good uh, a good consensus between uh, making sure that you know the university had uh, rights on the technology and revenues as well as allowing the company to have the freedom to uh, expand and, and build on that success uh, and and, uh, and I think we, we we got that so I, I mean I don't have um, uh, specific uh, feedback on that on that process for me it, it, it went pretty well uh, and then in terms of the patent uh, yeah that's I see the question that I have uh, myself regarding the uh, the value of, of software patents uh, I, I believe they have value but it's also easily abused uh, so it's interesting to uh, really put the the right uh, thoughts in terms of uh, exactly what do we want to protect, how we do want to protect it. Um, and uh, it may not be always the, the same answer. It, it, uh, patenting may not always be the, the, the right way to go. Uh, for us, uh, we've uh, patented uh, some uh, key statistical algorithms that uh, we've developed at the university to speed up the analysis that we are doing. Uh, and uh, so that was uh, part of the of the licensing for the company to uh, 
cover the cost of the patent that uh, was issued through uh, through university, uh, and uh, and then protect us uh, moving forward. And then since then we had another experience with patent. We filed one in 2016 around the technology to uh, protect sensitive data when we uh, work with a cloud-based solutions because our long-term plan is to have a product being available as a service uh, in the cloud, but dealing with critical infrastructure, we need to be extremely careful with um, uh, not uh, having critical data, sensitive data being uh, put outside of organizations. So how do we uh, how do we satisfy the needs of of being able to do computation in the cloud while keeping sensitive data inside the organization? So we have a technology around this, and that's why we we find a second patent, and this one this one on the company side. But overall, uh, the journey was, uh, I mean, the, the, the relationship with OTM went, went pretty well. Thanks, Robin. I was very excited to hear that you're now 15 employees, and I thought we could talk a little bit about the team. So yeah. where are you now? Um, I think, you know, you had transitioned to Chicago. Some of the team was still here. Bill Sanders, the faculty founder, is now the dean of Carnegie Mellon's College of Engineering. So exciting things have happened in transitions. In this yep. virtual era, are you operating all over? Yes, yeah, so the team is mostly based in Chicago. Uh, we have, I would say, two thirds of the team working remotely. Uh, one third, I mean, folks who are actually close to the office prefer to come to the office. Uh, we are lucky to have uh, an office in Chicago where they, they take this very seriously. They, they, they clean everything. They, they have a temperature check when you arrive. Uh, so it's, it's uh, it's been uh, it's been okay uh, for for the last few months, um, but then in terms of of team growth, um, I think this was part of this transition from being really tech centric to more like like uh, 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 focused on also the the business side of things. So earlier this year this year we've invested in customer success. So we had two account managers plus one director of of customer success joining, and the goal there was to talk more with our customers because before we were not having the bandwidth to really have in-depth discussions with our users. We were selling the software, moving to the next one and then doing tech support, developing. Um, so, uh, so it was important that we also had a uh, discussion with them uh, monthly and making sure we, we knew uh, opportunities to uh, grow our footprint there. So that was the first thing we've done this year, invest in, in, in customer success. And then uh, with COVID, uh, a big part of our leads were trade shows and conferences. Uh, that, that's how we, we, uh, we did Legion uh, over the last few years. So with COVID and no longer having in-person meetings, uh, that was really, a, we, we shifted all our marketing dollars from in-person conferences to online marketing. And so for that, we hired a director of marketing in July and she's, uh, she's leading a force now to build campaigns and uh, and have much more online presence and, and online interaction with with our users so that's something new for us because we've haven't done much before in that in that area uh, and then uh, uh, strengthening the product team so we are hiring uh, we hired a, a lead engineer a month ago uh, before i was the i was still uh, managing the developers and the product roadmap so now we have someone to do that um, and then, uh, and then also investing in direct sales. So we have a, a business dev who is now taking care of all the, the inbound interest we're receiving and also developing a process to start doing an outbound sales process. Great, well, I think it's, it's good to hear that you're growing both on the customer success side and taking care of those customers that you win, but also the business development and marketing aspects, which are really needed to go beyond being a research company or an R&D company into one that's right. achieving revenue. Um, so was that a difficult decision? Was that something that you as a team came to a consensus of? Is it something that investors urged? Just curious how you made that transition. No, I think that was, you know, I think that was decided last year uh, in terms of, um, of the growth, uh, uh, we you know we're very well aware that we have this unfair unfair market advantage with our relationship with NERC, 
uh, where NERC is kind of driving the visibility we have and, and our, our inbound leads. And we are, we are very well aware of that. And if we want to expand to other industries, we won't have NERC in other industries. So we need to really uh, build a, a extremely, uh, a, extremely uh, efficient uh, sales team. And so we decided last year to uh, raise the round. I mean, starting to uh, look at, at raising the round and, and really leveraging our, our niche market here to uh, improve our, our sales and marketing abilities to then, when we have that really ready, target that to another industry and, and start making revenue in another industry. I'm also curious a little bit about your transition to Chicago. So for champagne companies, many of them may end up having leadership in Chicago as well. Why mm -hmm. did you choose Chicago? What's been good about Chicago for you um, beyond the research expertise that you started with here? Yes, yeah, so we wanted to uh, not be far from Champagne. Our roots are in Champagne, and we wanted to uh, to keep uh, to keep that relationship with uh, with the university. Um, and so um, it was just a decision that uh, there was uh, a need for uh, maybe starting to interact with with um, uh, businesses in the Chicago area more often, and so. Instead of having to drive up all the time, we, we said we can establish a presence over there. So we had the two offices uh, for a few years, both in Champaign and, and Chicago. And then it, it uh, made sense to actually, we decided two years ago, let's, let's really have a team who can meet in person. So let's try to uh, concentrate everyone in Chicago. But that uh, now with COVID, that, that's changing all that, of course. But um, yeah, that was... It's been it's been a, a good a good transition. I think the uh, the fact that we can you know fly away to uh, all major cities and see our customers in person quickly uh, from Chicago was was a, a good advantage as well. And which neighborhood are you in? We're in the Loop, uh, so we are on the twelfth floor of the uh, Lyric Opera Technexus, so right next to the river right there. So we've had good relationships with TechNexus along the way as well. Are they, um, have you considered working with them as an investor or are you using relationships in that location to be with other startup companies or other advantages of that location? Yeah, no, I, and I, I think that's something we've, um, we've kept from uh, our, our initial years at uh, Enterprise Works is that when we decided to move to Chicago, I didn't want to rent an office and be isolated. I wanted to be in a, in a community where other startups would be. And so that's why we picked TechNexus. Uh, so we've established good, good relationship with uh, other startups over there. Uh, I've established uh, really uh, uh, key connections with other CEOs. So we're sharing our, our, our challenges, uh, best practices. So that's been, that's been really good. And then, uh, yeah, talking to, uh, to Fred and Terry at, at TechNexus around uh, uh, the resources they have and, and uh, in terms of investment and, and connections, they, they did some. Daniel. Hey, Robin, uh, Daniel here. Um, just because I know a common question we get and you've actually lived it firsthand. What would be some advice you would give to people coming out of an academic setting into startup life, uh, uh, particularly when it relates to pitching to and meeting uh, VCs? To not overestimate the technology or underestimate the sense and marketing aspect. Uh, often when we come from academia, we think that we just build the best product we dream of and that's it. Uh, it will sell itself and we'll have success, uh, but that's very far from, from the truth. Uh, so having this sales man mindset from the beginning uh, really helps a lot. Um, there's a lot of great products and, and the companies that are winning are, are the ones that are able to combine uh, extremely good sales and marketing with, with a great technology. And often actually we see examples of companies succeeding purely on sales and marketing and, and not having the best product in the market. Uh, of course, that's not the model we want to, to follow, but, uh, but I think, yeah, to, to, um, to be aware of that from the, uh, as early as possible, uh, it, it, it took me, uh, I think, some time to, uh, to really uh, uh, include that in the way I'm thinking, uh, but I think that, that would be my advice, yeah. 
Well, it sounds like you've made that transition from our earlier discussion. I'm sure Daniel's happy about that too. Um, technology doesn't usually sell itself, although right. it's starting to in your business. <laughs> right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I think that's one of the common things we see um, is sort of techno, especially being part of the university is a lot of deep technology. Um, but really understanding how that te technology makes somebody's life better um, is a critical aspect of that. And something I think Network Perception figured out pretty early on has been, has been able to scale how they were able to bootstrap I, was that mm -hmm. impressive in my yep. mind uh, for what they were trying to do. Yep. Well, I think I'm gonna wrap up Robin and thank you today for sharing your startup story. It's great to have you back at Enterprise Works today. Uh, the, this location was the beginning home of the company, but we're happy to see you flourishing in Chicago and working with other entrepreneurs at TechNexus and your involvement continues with many of the entrepreneurial ecosystem partners we have at Illinois Ventures, Sarah Ventures, OTM, and others that make us have a great startup community. So thank you for joining us for all our guests today and congratulations to Network Perception on your growth. Thank you very much. Thanks.